The prehistoric oceans were bubbling with leviathans, from the reptilian serpentine mosasaurs and plump powerful pleosaurs to giant sharks. Toothed predators almost the size of whales were commonplace up until fairly recently. This is of course well known, but an area of the prehistoric sea not often talked about is the deep sea, where some of the largest predators in the ocean live today. Some of the earliest fossils ever discovered were stalked crinoids, or sea lilies, that are plant-shaped relatives of starfish and sea urchins. Their fossils are extremely common, and so have been well known about for over 200 years. But they only live at depths of lower than 100 meters or so, meaning they live in an area extremely difficult to get to before the 20th century. This means that the earliest glimpse of life in the deep was actually most likely through their fossils. The overwhelming majority of seafloor exists at a depth where light cannot reach it, and so photosynthesis cannot happen. There are other ways energy can be transferred into the food chain, however, typically across much of the ocean's depth, the animals have to rely on falling debris from the surface to survive. Most of the time, this means scraps, but once in a while they can hit the jackpot, and a giant visitor can sink to the floor, a 50 ton plus whale. Not long after the creature makes contact with the bottom, the native wildlife will set to work and strip it of flesh and fat, with specifically adapted species of clams, snails, and other creatures that have evolved to devour their preferred part of the whale. One of the final stages of the whale fall requires an incredibly specialized group of creatures. Osadax, sometimes referred to as zombie worms, break down the giant bones of the whales. From a distance, their colonies can look like red fur swaying in the current. Because you have to be extremely lucky to stumble across a whale fall by accident, the complex ecosystems they create have only really been studied since the 90s, and Osadax was only discovered in 2002. But since very early in their discovery, scientists predicted that they may actually predate whale bones. The genetic study of Osadax, based on the molecular clock calibration used for deep sea worms, found that the current species split from their relatives during the Cretaceous period, long before whales evolved and so must have been feeding on something else before this time, the obvious candidate being the almost whale-sized marine reptiles that were terrorizing the sea at the time. After this study, museum marine reptile collections were heavily re-examined, and only within a few years, they found plesiosaur fossils over 100 million years old that were riddled with the boreholes that perfectly matched the signature of an Osadak species. And since then, they have also found ancient turtles that had similar boreholes as well. Since stumbling across a whale fall in the dark depths is rare, a lot of what is known about them is actually from scientists creating them, by finding a beached whale and sinking the carcass out at sea, and then studying what happens. In the Gulf of Mexico, scientists sunk three alligators to study the results, and after their flesh had been stripped away by deep sea creatures, their bones became shrouded in the red fuzz of an Osadak species. When the bones were studied, it was found that these Osadax belonged to two new, unique species most likely specialized specifically to consume reptilian bones. This may explain what the Osadax would have been feeding on for the almost 20 million year gap between the extinction of the marine reptiles and the colonization of the oceans by whales. Alligators can drown and get washed out to sea down the Mississippi, and this is a fate that can happen to other crocodile species elsewhere in the world. Crocodiles are probably the most similar living animals to marine reptiles, and are one of a handful of animals that survived and bounced back very quickly after the KPG extinction. It is possible this could have given Osadax a food source until whales evolved around 47 million years ago, which is when Osadax became incredibly more diverse, and many new species of whale bone devourers evolved. So just like modern whales, there is strong evidence that dead marine reptiles sunk into the abyss to be fed on by deep sea creatures. However, some of these marine reptiles may have journeyed into the deep while still alive as well. It has been argued that features and body shape of several marine reptiles would have made them good deep sea hunters, similar to modern day sperm whales. One marine reptile named Ophthalmosaurus had massive eyes that it may have used to navigate through the darkness of the Jurassic Deep. Relatively, it had the largest eyes of any vertebrate that has ever existed. Study of Ophthalmosaurus's efficient fish-shaped body has shown that it was most likely physically capable of reaching into the deep. However, whether it actually did is more difficult to prove. Almost all of Ophthalmosaurus's fossils are known from fossil beds that would have been shallow coastal waters when these creatures were alive. 
The issue is that most of the adaptations for deep sea diving that can be observed from fossils alone are usually good for a nocturnal predator as well, and so Ophthalmosaurus could have just been nocturnal. Much later, 70 million years ago, an unlikely small marine reptile may have made brief excursions into the deep in what would become Japan. Phosphorosaurus was an alligator-sized mosasaur that lived at the end of the Cretaceous period and was very small compared with the 10 meter plus mosasaurs that were common around this time and that it would have shared its habitat with. But the little creature didn't just differ in size, it was actually quite different in body shape. It had very large binocular eyes and actually a very different skull shape in general to other mosasaurs, giving it a unique appearance. Its large eyes could have helped it navigate the deep, but also fossilized lanternfish have been discovered in the same area as their remains, which, at least in modern times, are deep sea fish. However, lanternfish migrate to the surface at night to feed on phytoplankton, so their presence still isn't necessarily a smoking gun for a deep sea diving marine reptile. However, out of all the possible contenders for a deep sea diving marine reptile, the most compelling by far was the plesiosaur named Abyssosaurus. Abyssosaurus was from a group of medium-sized plesiosaurs called the Cryptoclydids, that are some of the most common fossils of plesiosaurs found, which means their anatomy is very well researched. They were a diverse group of animals adapted to many niches, and every increment in between, so there is a good standard to assess from when you discover a group of species of them that are specialised into a different lifestyle. Some, like Cryptocolidus, were adapted to live in the shallows. Their fossils are well known from southern England that had shallow water stretching miles out from the coast during the Jurassic. At the same time, North America had a shallow inland sea known as the Sundance Sea that, among many quirks, had several native Cryptocolidid species that had adapted to life in these shallow waters as well and had converged on many of the same features of Cryptocolidus, like a more accentuated curve in their foreflippers. On the flip side, there were many Cryptoclydidae that would have been well adapted to swimming and hunting in the open seas, like the Kalimbosaurines, that are identified by their unusually large propodial that may have helped with open ocean cruising. Plesiosaur numbers started to dwindle towards the end of the Jurassic around 145 million years ago, and although there were some species that actually survived right until the end of the Cretaceous, dying out with the dinosaurs, their numbers were significantly reduced throughout the period, one of the last groups of plesiosaurs that diversified were a group of cryptocolliders that managed to cling on surviving up in the Arctic, their fossils being discovered on the island of Svalbard in Norway. They were related to the open ocean swimming Columbosaurines, but had a bunch of unique adaptations. They had very large eyes for plesiosaurs, and the angle of the muscle attached between their body and flipper suggests they would have been far more adept at moving up and down through the water column rather than cruising it is very likely that they spent their lives diving. Finally, about 130 million years ago, the evolution of these last surviving plesiosaurs culminated in the most extremely adapted diving cryptocolidid, and arguably one of the strangest plesiosaurs to have lived, Abyssosaurus, discovered in Russia. Abyssosaurus had the largest eyes relative to their body size compared to the other diving plesiosaurs, and its muscle attachments were at the harshest angle, it's possible that the large eyes these cryptocolliders had was to help with the dark winters they may have endured, being so far north, but since the best diver had the largest eyes, it would make sense if they were also for navigating the deep. Abyssosaurus had a very unusual head shape, unlike any other plesiosaur including its close relatives, where it had a very narrow snout but large bulging skull. Whales and dolphins have a web of blood vessels weaved across the back of their skull and around their neck vertebrae, called the retia mirabilia, and it is thought to alleviate blood pressure while they undulate their body up and down through the water. Sperm whales have a particularly big retia mirabilia, probably because they have to deal with a high pressure from both their movement and their deep sea environment, so the unusually large skull shows that plesiosaurs could have had a similar feature that had grown particularly large in Abyssosaurus. During the early Cretaceous, Asia, Europe and North America were closer together. The Arctic Ocean was much smaller, and due to higher global temperatures there wouldn't have been any ice caps at the poles, which is the habitat that these cryptoclided plesiosaurs clung on, ending with the Abyssosaurus. The deep sea is a lot more stable and less affected by climate change and other destructive forces, which may explain why these diving plesiosaurs were able to outlast so many of their relatives. 
Today, there are several whale species that have all adapted to deep sea diving separately, and also elephant seals that are from a completely different aquatic lineage have been proven to hunt in the deep too. These environments tend to be a lot more stable, but also air-breathing creatures tend to have a distinct advantage on creatures that live in the relatively low oxygen environments of the deep, and so it is not entirely unsurprising that some marine reptiles may have evolved in a similar way. There is a fair amount of evidence of how the surface animals would have interacted with the deep sea environments of the time. However, little is known about the prehistoric deep sea itself. The conditions in the deep sea are not very good for fossilization. For instance, several of the processes that form sedimentary rocks don't happen in the deep sea, the rock type that contains the overwhelming majority of fossils. In the unlikely event that something did fossilize, the fossil bed is much less likely to rise above the sea over time than coastal habitats so most of them will still be underwater. Furthermore, in response to their incredibly harsh environment, many deep sea creatures are soft bodied, don't fossilize well, and tend to be eaten entirely, as little goes to waste in the deep, due to how rare energy is. These factors make paleontological study of the deep very difficult, so just like today, the prehistoric deep sea is incredibly difficult to study. Thank you for watching. A big thank you goes to all my patrons, especially the big contributors that are listed here. If you like content like this, then consider becoming a patron as well.